I remember when, I know this is an unrelated thing in so many ways, but this movement, this very, it was a sort of a spectacle, but a disruptive movement, like Extinction Rebellion in the UK. I remember there was one, I remember this years ago, they were trying to stop or they were trying to protest something doing with climate change, of course. And they had some activists that were like on a subway or some kind of public transit. And everyone that was waiting to get into this public, tra- this subway, whatever it was, this train, were really angry at the activists, like, get the fuck out of the way. Like, we just want to go to work, right? And I think that resonates with how I would imagine U.S. Americans would talk about it or feel about it if no one's picking up my trash. I can't even go go five kilometers or whatever the equivalent of that is in the U.S. I can't even go a few miles to my job. I have to walk now. Like, all of these things we would see as a huge inconvenience and not specifically related to what the concerns are of the protesters and the protests themselves, right? Like, why would that have anything to do with my ability to feed my family and take care of shit, yeah. right? So on that level of you talking about your husband, and I'm sure countless other people in France right now that just have to walk to work because transit isn't there anymore, or they have to put their trash in the garage if they have a garage or, you know, any of these like little things that we just sort of take for granted as sort of just the background of a functioning sort of modern society all of a sudden are stop, you know, and what I guess it's it's a yeah, it's a shift of consciousness for sure. If you're from the U.S. and trying to live in this mm-hmm. environment now, all of a sudden are people just like this is worth the sacrifice because it seems the it seems like sorry one last thing is that in the u.s u.s politicians and media people will be like they're trying to attack you the working person they're making your life bad and <laughs> but i'm sure in france the perspective's a little more um complex and different yeah that line that scare tactic does not work here um mm. i would say not everyone is in favor of it there, there is anger, but, you know, for example, polling, you know, they've been doing polling since the beginning and the majority of people uh, nationwide are in support of it. Mm. Um, you know, they realize because here there is a long history of this working. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that's kind of the, the social history of France, especially the labor history of France, especially when you look at like workers' rights and, you know, what's going on right now, you know, what specifically sparked this was Macron wanting to change the retirement age. Um, and also wanting to tighten up what, you know, to be frank, is a very generous retirement policy as far as Western democracies are concerned. But again, the reason they have such a generous policy is because because they fought for it, is because they struck for it, is because people went without basic necessities in order to force the government to the point where the government had to concede. And here there's a very long history of that working. I mean, even even the yellow vest, which, you know, I mean, I I think I talked about it with you. I talked about it with, with several people. Mm-hmm. You know, it was a very complicated movement that in many ways kind of lacked focus, lacked purpose, was more just an expression of anger, I'd say. Mm-hmm. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the, the government at the end of the day pretty much gave a hundred euro pay pay raise to every minimum wage worker as, mm-hmm. you know, okay, we'll give you this. Just, just fucking stop, please. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there hits a point where usually, especially historically, there has been a concession. Um, Macron is different. And, you know, a lot of the criticism that is being um, um, thrown at him right now, both within the government, but also, you know, analysts on the outside who are looking at this is like, he doesn't get that. He doesn't seem to understand that there, there hits a point where you have to listen to the people and you have to concede. That's just it's kind of a part of the social contract here just as a generous retirement is a part of the social contract here there, you know, the, the social contract here is much more. And again, you know, you go back to, to French history, you know, you go back to the storming of the Bastille being basically about people not being able to eat. Mm-hmm. Um, the compromise mm-hmm. that came from the Republic was between the rich and the poor was basically, you know, if we, if, if we have enough to survive, you can keep your head. But once we don't, hell will break loose. And that's been the history of France since 1789. I mean, you know, with with a few couple of rocks in the road, um, you know, I don't want to go through 230 years of French history right now. Um, but but needless to say, you know, that's how the French labor movement was won. That's how the progressive um, work week becoming shorter, retirement benefits becoming more general, you know, France arguably has the most generous welfare state in the world. And that's what Macron is trying to dial back. Mm. Uh, he's a neoliberal. 
he, he, you know, that's not good for business. That's not good for the GDP. That's not, you know, good for his, his wealthy banker friends. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's been his agenda from the very beginning to roll things back. And people here just aren't having it because it, it's, you know, it's, it's more than just, I mean, and again, we talk about like the way that this has been framed by the Anglophone media, right? You know, mm -hmm. I, I open up CNN and it's like, people are so angry about the retirement age. And like, hmm. Not really. You know, that's like saying the yellow vest <laughs> was about gas prices. That's, yeah. that, that was the spark. That's what started it. Yeah. But it's like the, the straw that broke the camel's back. That's really what's going on here. This this is no longer about, I mean, m most of the, frankly, you know, you did talk about like generational disillusionment, you know, so many of the people I know on the streets don't think we're going to have a functioning society by the time they retire anyway. You know, right. the, the high schoolers, the college students are out there. They're not looking at 62 versus 64. That's not what this is about for them. Mm -hmm. um, this is much more of a revolt against Macron and his policies and the neoliberal agenda that's been pushed onto France since he took office in 2017. So, but, you know, I realized I digressed a bit uh, going back to what you were saying. You know, overall, people are tolerant of it because they know, they understand why. And even if they're not out there in the streets yelling as well, they they sympathize and for the most part agree with the anger and it's something like two well over two thirds of the population was opposed to the reform that Macron just pushed through without a vote. Yeah. So people are furious. You know, they believe democracy is broken. They believe what he did was rather tyrannic, tyrannical and much more uh, like into a fascist government than a so-called democracy. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have you know the other the other day I think it was last Wednesday or Thursday one of the street protests. We had some rich old guy come up to us and just start yelling at us, you know, get a job, go home, <laughs> stop setting fires, you know, the same bullshit you'll hear from any, you know, right winger in the U.S. So I'm not going to say that, you know, there's, there's definitely people who are against what's going on. Um, yeah. I would also say that overall they are in the minority and, and the, the amount of tolerance overall for what's going on is exact again something else that just shocks me as an American because I, I I would say to myself the same thing that you just said like oh my god if this was going on in the United States I you know but you know people here they have they understand solidarity they understand class consciousness they understand why it's going on and they're pissed and so if they have to deal with slight inconveniences in the hope that a, either the law will be rescinded, B, you know, what a lot of people want right now. I think it's it's gone much more to the, you know, we want Macron to resign. Um, they're willing to to put up with inconveniences in the hope that perhaps one of those results will come to, to be. I mm. um, remember one of the times that we spoke, we talked about how I think it was with uh, Jelly Jean, and it was about the fact that, you know, from the, again, from the outside in, it's like any sort of mass movement like this, we tend to associate as having a sort of leftist origin or some kind of, you know, uh, elements of class consciousness, but really having kind of a leftist tilt. Mm -hmm. But as you've explained, and as you've, you know, as I've come to become more educated on this fact, is that that divide or that sort of character of a mass movement in France does not necessarily have that to it, right? It doesn't have to be that. In fact, you could argue that on the far right, they have similar certain perspectives that um, would be viewed as left wing in the US, except for the whole, you know, let's not let immigrants in and refugees in and the sort of <laughs> basically kind of French supremacist or white supremacist, you know, yeah. version of, of whatever is in France, right? So, Certainly, that's an element, but I'm curious, you know, as far as this movement goes, it is is um, kind of like what is the kind of character of it? Can like I guess maybe in the long term, as this plays out, whatever the consequences it are, you know, let's say Macron does resign or gets forced out. I mean, there mm -hmm. are right wing elements in France that would try to take advantage of that situation. Yeah. I'm sure. So I'm curious what maybe some of the consequences would be of of getting something like mm -hmm. that through. Yeah. I would, you know, well, there's kind of two questions there. So let me try to uh, piece it together if I can. You know, unlike, you know, this, this, the Gilets Jaunes, for example, you know, that really actually started as a right wing movement, which was something I tried to stress to American anarchists until I was blue in the face. Because, you know, mm -hmm. like you say, you know, you, they, they associate certain values that are associated solely with the, the left wing or the center left, whatever you call the 
you know, AOC or whatever mm -hmm. in the United States. But just as you said, you know, here the the idea of horseshoe theory, well, it doesn't hold in simplicity. It's more relevant. Um, mm -hmm. when it comes to things like a generous welfare state, for example. The right and left are in agreement. The disagreement is who gets that. Right. The left wants everyone to have that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the right only wants certain people to have that. But mm -hmm. but the that that is the generous welfare state, you know, that's that's what united right and left during the Gilets Jean movement. You know, overall they were fighting for for a higher minimum wage, for a better standard of living. Mm -hmm. And same here, unlike the Gilets Jean this time, this was definitely this was this was instigated by the union, by the syndicate. Um and so I would say it had much more of you know, the, the, who, who with the match was the left wing. But, you know, for example, when Macron pushed that, that the law through without a vote, which is what really provoked the last week's worth of, you know, social media images of absolutely everything on fire, mm -hmm. the first person to condemn him was Marine Le Pen. Mm. Um, and, and her party was the first to push, to, to put through a motion of censor, a motion of, of no confidence, which, you know, there were two motions that were put through, one by her, and then one by a coalition of everyone except the far right, because no one was going to vote for her motion simply because of who she was. Hmm. Um, so there, you know, there's, but, you know, for example, last week, there was a protest here um, of fishermen. Of, you know, so Brittany is a peninsula where we're surrounded by coastline on three sides and the northern coast is the English Channel. Mm -hmm. And especially since Brexit, but also to an extent because of Macron's policies, um, the fishing industry has been deeply, deeply suffering. Um, and they can't, you know, they are one of many groups of people, farmers being another, that are more than ever are struggling to survive. They also tend to be rural and vote far right. Um, they all converged on, on Hren because Hren is the capital of Brittany, um, last Thursday, um, last Wednesday. It was Wednesday. And kind of two separate, you know, they had an official delegation of like a dozen people that were going to meet with politicians. And then they had a thousand fishermen show up at 10 in the morning, armed with fireworks and bottles, um, ready for battle. And I can tell you, as someone who's been out in over a dozen street protests in the past two months in France, the most violent thing I've seen <laughs> in two months were those fishermen. Oh, my God. I mean, they they didn't. They didn't even like pretend to just they were going to march. No, they immediately they went into battle. They mm -hmm. went into battle with the police in a way that, frankly, you know, puts black bloc anarchists to shame in terms of just the, the I got to say it, the balls, the hutzpah, the, the degree to which they were willing mm -hmm. to charge and be like, frankly, incredibly recklessly violent. Right. Um, it was it was terrifying. It was mm -hmm. terrifying. Mm -hmm. And and. You know, kind of like the difference between how the police in the United States treat Black Lives Matter versus uh, Charlottesville. Um, mm -hmm. I feel, the, considering the amount of violence levied at the police, they were treated with kid gloves. Um, I've seen the, poli the police, the police were much more violent the next day when it was anarchists doing similar things. Mm -hmm. um, but but I was just I was just amazed at 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 their because. They were acting in a way that, again, you know, anyone seeing the pictures, not knowing who they were, would have immediately thought black bloc, you know, or as I say here, the Kessler, you know, the anarchist, the extreme left, the, the mm. whatever. Um, but those were, those guys are as far right as you could come. <laughs> yeah. Wow. You know, chucking bottles at the police and, and shooting fireworks at the cops and charging water cannons and just, you know, and frankly trashed by noon. Um, Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just kind of, you know, I was ducking and running and just going, oh, my God, like, but, you know, but the other interesting thing about it is, you know, I was there and other people were there because despite the fact that they're far right, they're still fighting for the same thing. So kind of, you know, what what you talked about before, you know, they, they aren't they aren't active white supremacists or, or you know, they're not mm -hmm. flying a Nazi flag, you know, they wouldn't be able to anywhere here. Um, but, yeah. you know, my point being like, you know, if they were. If they were very um, conscious racists, making a point of being conscious racists, of course, we would not have shown up to support them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, fascism feeds off of desperation. And the reason they they vote far right is because they are being screwed by the government as well and have bought into a different narrative. 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's, I, you know, it's, it's what we call the, the convergence de lutte here, the, the joining of the fights. You know, there's, there's more of an understanding here that overall we agree with more than we disagree with. And in certain instances, it helps both parties to be on the same side temporarily in instances like that. So you had a bunch of anarchists show up (laughs) to back (laughs) up a bunch of fishermen who really want to fucking throw projectiles at top. Mm. You know, and the fascinating, now, you know, like at the beginning, you know, perfect example of this, you know, there were two far, there were two uh, Front National, uh, no, Rassemblement National, sorry, they changed their name. Mm. Um, All right, rebranded itself recently. Um, You know, and they showed up and they did an interview with the media at the beginning and they were going on about, yeah, we're here to support the real workers. We're here to support the, you know, we're going to support Mm -hmm. the fishermen. But let me tell you something. The first bottle thrown, those two fucking guys ran so fast. They got the, they, they were there to support for 20 minutes. Mm. And then they ran the second they realized that, that there was a chance of them getting hurt. But you know who stuck around? The anarchists. Mm-hmm. And for me, you know, as someone who is both participant and analyst, I look at that and I'm like, you know, I hope those guys go home mm-hmm. and at least remember who had their back and who ran away. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not like anarchists are going to run for office. It's not necessarily going to help <laughs> who they may vote for in the next election. But I can't help but have a certain amount of hope that, like, you know, in terms of solidarity, in terms of who had your back and who didn't. And who's actually on your side, as opposed to who is using you for votes so that they can push forth their racist agenda. I hope some of those guys left understanding that. I can only mm. hope. Right. Well, let me um, let me ask from like a leftist perspective then. Like, so again, from the as you describe the Anglophone kind of media frames it as a very singular issue that's being overblown, right? People are so angry about a, such a small thing. Like, yeah, we changed our retirement age here. We don't give a shit, right? No one gets mad. No one gets as angry in the U.S. when they change full benefits age from Social Security or something, you know? So there's, there's, but there isn't really, a, I don't think, a good equivalent here in the U.S. to what's happening in France. And I think that's part of the problem with not understanding kind of this, the, the situation. But also, I'm curious from um, yeah, from an anarchist or, or sort of a radical leftist perspective, you know, getting involved in this movement and agitating in this way. I mean, what is the purpose of that? If you if it doesn't have you know, if it, it's obviously about Macron, but it's also seemingly about projecting a little bit into the future of like we want to actually abolish you know, the state on some level, we want to Mm -hmm. move in a direction where we're creating more egalitarian systems. I mean, that's kind of the ideal, right? So getting involved in this kind of, again, it seems reductionist to just think it's about this, you know, change in in, in this reform that was pushed through, it seems to be about something bigger than this. So like, if you were to look at it from that perspective, like, why get involved in this? Why put your body on the line for Mm -hmm. this? Well, there's, there's two levels of it you know first is just again you know even if you're a far leftist even if you want to abolish this society and start a new one i think there's still the recognition that for the moment we are in this society and you know your grandpa worked really hard his whole life and it's not fair for him to change the fucking retirement package at the last moment there's there again there's much more whether you're left or right there's a certain value system that I feel is much more cohesive here than Mm. in the United States, where there's, you know, there's people who believe as we do, but then, like I always say, like I digress a bit, you know, Americans overall um, live to work and the French work to live. And I think Mm. that's the difference. Mm. You listen to American politicians go on about, you know, wanting to add second, third, fourth jobs or whatever. And, you know, the idea that there's nothing wrong with you know, how you should be proud to be working 70, 80 hours a week. And you hear American working class people mimic that. Mm-hmm. You don't hear that here. Nobody, nobody's going to take pride in, in working even 50 hours a week. Frankly, if they have to, they're going to be the first ones out there broke probably on the street screaming against it. Because again, it's a violation of the, of the social contract here. Um, work, you know, it's, 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 it, this is a historically Catholic country, that Protestant work ethic thing just, it's never mm-hmm. sunk in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the Huguenots were violently expelled. <laughs> this mm-hmm. country wanted nothing to do with that value system. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, on one hand, I think even, even the far left are, are fighting 
to maintain the, the current retirement package, um, if only for the comfort of those around us, because we recognize that even if we want to overthrow the social order and start anew, it's not going to happen tomorrow. And in the meantime, people need to live and survive. And again, they've, they've worked for something that they've been told they would have. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. That, that part of the contract needs to be fulfilled. On the other hand, you know, I can say there's been an amazing amount of organizing within the, you know, I can only speak for the city where I live, but, you know, a, a huge contingent of, of the folks who have been, been driving a lot of the, especially the blockages, these economic blockages. Um, you know, there's one group in the city, for example, that they, they call themselves the Maison de Peuple, the House of the People. Um, and what they actually became known six or seven years ago, um, during the protests in 2016 over changing the labor laws, um, they overtook, um, they occupied a then empty building, historic building in Han that had a long left its history to it. And they started a Maison de Peuple. They started a, you know, basically anarchist people's space. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, they created the society that they wanted to have. They, you know, giving workshops all day, giving away free food, doing, you know, skill shares, you know, it, it was a mutual aid center that I want to say lasted for about two months before the city decided to shut it down. Mm-hmm. Um, at the beginning of this, about six weeks ago, they took over that same building at the end of one of the first big protests. Um, this time it only lasted a day and a half and they were pushed out. Um, they then took over a second building um, about three weeks ago. They took over a um, an old cinema that had since moved to a bigger, nicer building. Um, and again, they were pushed out within two days, but they stayed together as an organization. And, you know, they are currently looking for a space to, to make basically a permanent, you know, space to create the world we want to create. And a lot of the and you know what's what's good about it is you know that's their mission but they again they they're organizing economic blockages they're organizing this they're organizing that they're making it clear that part of their mission is also to support you know what I would call the institutional left the unions mm-hmm. and frankly I think that support has been very appreciated you know there's this interesting balance that happens um, between the institutional left and the radical left in France, which is kind of unique. Well, especially, from, you know, it wouldn't exist in the U.S. because the U.S. doesn't have an institutional left. <laughs> um, yeah, right. But, you know, mm-hmm. what happens is where, you know, take a protest, for example. You know, the unions declare the protest. The unions work out the logistics, you know, when it's going to start, when it's going to, where it's going to be with the city. You know, they do all that. The head of the protest is often a mixture of, you know, high school students, university students, the, you know, the student union and various, you know, anarchist black blockers, whoever. Um, they're the ones who take the head uh, because they're, they're the ones who are going to end up running into the cops the f- first. Mm-hmm. And they confront the police. They're the ones who take the brunt of it. They're the ones who get the tear gas. The unions are behind. The unions are being essentially protected. Mm-hmm. Um but there's like this separation that's maintained. It's like super interesting where, you know, if and when necessary, the unions will disavow the violence. They have to. Mm-hmm. Um, but they don't disavow those groups in and of themselves mm-hmm. because they under, because there's this like kind of unspoken working relationship that goes on where each group realizes the necessity of the other for being able to do what, you know, for, for being able to, to accomplish each one's goals. Mm. And I just, I find that super fascinating to watch. And it is, is sometimes this delicate dance. Um, and frankly, sometimes, you know, the unions piss the fuck out of, you know, they go too far in condemning and they, they piss yeah. off the radical left. Um, you know, and then sometimes, you know, for example, the, protest three or four days ago where the un- the unions ended up getting tear gassed by the police, which almost never happened. Mm-hmm. And woo, you know, and we're sitting there like, yeah, see, do it. Yeah, I think cool. Is it? Yeah. You maybe have a little mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Kind of yeah. sucks, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um so you know I find that because you know the unions, I mean, they have an extremely radical history. You know, 50 mm-hmm. years ago they 
I mean, a lot of the, the guys, you know, the student tie types nowadays, you know, they were ones out doing what we we're doing in 68. So, you know, they, there's this dance they have to do in terms of like retaining legitimacy in mm-hmm. working with the government mm-hmm. and also to an extent under, not only, you know, under, I wouldn't say supporting, but understanding the strategic value of what the, the the radical left is doing, because there is a strategic value to it. That's what scares the shit out of the government the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. it, it, the, 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 it is not the last six, you know, previous six weeks worth of demonstrations that's really gotten outsiders going, oh, you know, it was mm-hmm. the 200 fires set in Paris a week ago. It's mm-hmm. pictures of every major city within one night in France on fire. Um, that has that pushes towards the union's goals, mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. unions know that. Mm-hmm. So you know, yeah, there's yeah, there's interesting dance. There's and there's this much more of you know, it's that whole. Um, um, diversity of tactics thing that people yeah. love to talk about in anarchist yeah. circles in the u.s but <laughs> it's gonna bring people it up. actually yeah. get what it means yeah yeah this right. i'm watching what it means in real time mm-hmm. and okay. it can it can be effective if you actually like use it as something other than like a hammer to wield when someone's doing something you don't like mm-hmm.